Cer certainly on now. All right. Um, again, thanks for the introduction. So I don't know how familiar the crowd here is with LIDAR. Um, I'm sort of going to jump right in and show some demos, and along the way, uh, um, we're going to figure everything out. There are some uh, URLs here where you can download this presentation. I show the same URL at the very end of the talk. So if you now you're probably not interested yet, but if at the end you haven't left yet, uh, you uh, you can maybe then download it. And also the software itself that I'm talking about is downloadable. So everything I'm doing right now here, you can then do at home or at school or whenever you want to. Um, as uh, Jörg pointed out, uh, there's uh, the software that sort of brought me here sort of was developed over the years without actually planning it, like these academic things happen. Um, LIDAR is, initially LIDAR for me was just a bunch of points. I was researching a topic where I wanted to construct triangulations for very, very large point sets. I had an idea, I had a solution, and I was looking for a problem. And the LIDAR field gave me the problem that was a lot of points, millions of points, that I knew how to triangulate, but I just was looking for somebody who needed to triangulate that many points. So initially, LIDAR points that you just seen here were stored in simple ASCII formats. And uh, initially, that was easy, and uh, everybody could work with it. But it quickly became apparent that that was very inefficient, because LIDAR sort of exploded. People quickly developed this technology. They realized how uh, powerful it was to capture the terrain, to capture structures on the terrain, to uh, create flood models, to create hydrographic models of terrain, to, to make forest inventories, to look if the power lines still had enough clearance from the branches, to, to find archaeological monuments in forests, you know, to, and so on and so on. There are so many uses. Fortunately, the ASPRS, it's the American Society for, and, and a lot of other words, um, had very early on the idea to create sort of a, a standard that's binary. Because ASCII is very inefficient to parse, and you can't seek. If you want to seek to point number 100 million and 10, you have to basically go through all the lines first to get to that point. So the binary format was very simple, and therefore very efficient, uh, and therefore very easy accepted and it became a, a standard without having to do very much and it's very simple there's a header at the beginning which has a bunch of things like the bounding box a scale and um, you know who created it and what the points look like roughly and then there are some records so for every point there's a data record that says XYZ coordinate of the point um, the intensity that the point has um, of where the laser hit. Um, uh, for every pulse, there, could be, there can be multiple returns. So this record also specifies, was this the first point of that pulse that was returned? Was it the second, the third? And how many were there in total? And a few other little details. And um, because when I started out, I wanted access to these points, just because I needed a lot of points, I wanted to read these files, but I couldn't find any reader for it. So I downloaded the specification of the website, wrote my own little reader in C++, and used it for my own science to create large triangulations. And eventually I thought, oh, that's kind of handy, so I put it on my web page. And a few months later, the first request comes, hey, I found a bug here. Uh, that doesn't work. I said, okay, I fixed it. And then I needed something more, so I added another tool. Then somebody else said, hey, this is really cool, but I need this. Can you add this? And I added this. And slowly by slowly, these requests became more and more frequent. And then somebody came and said, hey, this is a really cool code base. Can I fork it into a proper open source project? And that became LibLAS, and that forked in December 2007. And then a lot, lots of more development came, and eventually it became so uh, I decided to quit my job and 
do last tools professionally, like do it full time. And that's why I also now have an ArcGIS toolbox. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with that uh, product from Esri, but if you are, um, Esri is now coming out with the 10.1 version of ArcGIS, and they announce and make a big, huge marketing announcement everywhere. What it actually can do with LiDAR data is very, very little, but it's great for people like me or Jörg or everybody who is in the LiDAR business because it will expose many people to this kind of data and we will all benefit. And so I have a little toolbox that you can see there in the corner uh, where all the tools are basically exposed inside Esri. And Esri is a platform a lot of people are familiar with. So you get the familiar interface to the tools that have been around for a long time and you can run them from there. It's really just a wrapper. All right, um, a quick demo here working with LAS tools. So this is my own little GUI. The tools are really command line tools, so you run them from that little black box, which is scary to a lot of people. And because so often people like double clicked my executables and then said, I don't know, it doesn't work. A, a black box came quickly and then disappeared again. Um, I eventually decided to make a GUI to make the entry to LAS tools more simple. And, uh, but they're really best used in the command line. So you can now browse here. And this data set, for example, um, you only see now a, a box that's green. That's just a bounding box because I don't want to load the data. Last tools is really aiming for processing a lot, a lot of points. So if you have a lot of files, I just want to see the bounding boxes here and then run operations on them. This is really just sort of a command center for last tool so I can go into the view application I can say run and the nice thing about this uh, GUI is it teaches you the command line so before you actually get to do anything it writes you the command line up there and uh, in this case we're running the last view program minus I and then the pass and then we say start and there you see the data set that's actually a data set that was flown by York and uh, I called it FUSA because I thought it was Flinders University, but we just looked it up. Uh, the, the piece that I picked is actually not part of the campus. It, it, does anybody recognize it? It's because it's pretty nearby. It's just off campus. Maybe if I triangulate it. Uh, I don't know, I don't know how, if I have any unruly people in the audience. Maybe some of you spend a night in the, uh, in the sober up cell of uh, this building here because that's the local police department, I, I think. So, uh, and that's, what did you say, that was Shepherd's Road? Or Shepherd's? Oh, Stuart Road, okay. All right, but, so these are the kind of data sets we're working with. This already has been classified, so I can only display the ground points and then triangulate again. And then uh, you, you see a ground surface with all the buildings removed. Um, and so on. Um, and um, yeah, that's really all I want to show you. So that's how you can work with last tools. Some statistics that Jörg mentioned it. Um, there's, it's a very active user group. So because you can download the software and use it basically for free, there's a certain limitation at one point. But for research, the limitation isn't particularly disadvantageous. Um, there's a lot of people uh, using it every day. Um, you know, on, on all the social media uh, and on LinkedIn, and it, there's a lot of downloads over the past years. And it sort of has a dual licensing because initially everything was free, and I could, just couldn't really make a living of it. So now I have a dual licenses where the core is open source LGPL. The source code is provided. You can you know contribute, modify it. Um, and then there's a closed source part for some of the very advanced algorithms where you get the binaries, you can run them just like everybody else, but if you hit a certain point limit, like two, three million points, it adds some noise to the data. And that noise isn't targeted at you guys, that's targeted at commercial people trying to use it in their production workflows to sort of scare them a little bit into buying a license. Because uh, I, I, I ran into some people that were just using my tools commercially without license, and then I decided to add that. So. Um, 
one big success story uh, was the compressor. Um, because, as I said before, the, two, the, the point clouds became so big, these are just sort of some numbers I got from uh, customers I have. Um, you know, uh, these are numbers of points and terabytes that people are holding. Um, it's very nice to compress the points. But these kind of data form, the LAS form, doesn't compress very well if you just run WinZip. It just sort of goes down by 50%. And I spent most of my, you know, like master's and PhD and postdoc time on compressing triangle meshes, on polygon meshes. And uh, I thought I did a good job, but nobody ever used it. You know, like it was a pure academic thing. And uh, then this format came along, and I thought, oh, maybe if I compress this format, because there's so much content out there, maybe somebody's actually going to use it for once. And uh, that was turned out to be then quite rewarding. So compression, of course, everybody knows what it is. You know, when you go uh, diving or when you go hiking, you compress backpacks or oxygen. Um, for uh, lighter points, I mentioned before the standard compressors don't do quite as well. There's one commercial solution, but that sets you back $3,000 a seat. I don't think it's been sold very much uh, because there's LASIP, which is free, open source, LGPL, and uh, the whole nine yards. So I don't want to bo uh, bore you with the details, but compression sort of works. You have a point, and you sort of figure out where this point may be, or what the next symbol may be, or what the next timestamp may be, and then you just encode the correction. Why is that good? Because the correction is usually a much smaller number. And why is that good? Because these smaller numbers tend to spread around, or in this case, they tend to spread around the same numbers over and over again. So you have a distribution like that. And if you don't know anything about um, entropy coding or Shannon entropy, then you know that symbols that have this kind of distribution are much cheaper to code. Like if you have this distribution on the left, you only need 0.2 bits per symbol. If you have this distribution on the right, you need the, this is the most expensive one, you need two bits per symbol. And uh, the correctors more look like this side, whereas the original coordinates more look like this side. Um, there's lots of details. If you want to know the details, I gave a talk on this and somebody filmed it with YouTube and I annotated it and I put it on YouTube and there's not a whole lot of, uh, between all the funny cat videos, um, compression videos, it's 30 minutes uh, and it explains a bit more of the details. Here are some results. Um, I just took 27 random files that weren't very typical even. They were sort of experimental files because it was still at the beginning. I just took any file I could find. And then I zipped the files. This is the original size, 2.5 mega, uh, 2.5 gigabyte. Um, and zip guts it around down to half. Ra is a very good uh, coder for LIDAR in last format. Um, then there is this commercial solution, uh, and then there is a LUTS coder, which is uh, by far the best, but it gets even uh, more pronounced when you go to nice data. And nice meaning you have dense data straight off the scanner, sort of like the data we generate uh, when, uh, when York flies his funny airplanes. <laughs> uh, he likes when I say funny airplanes. Um, uh, we flew yesterday, and then you get the, the data right in, in uh, acquisition order, and the coder is sort of optimized for the points to be in acquisition order, because that's what the points usually are in. Here, for example, that's from the Department of Natural Resources in Minnesota. Let's have a look at how these look like. Here you see a typical flight line order. You see um, they, are, they are chopped up in tiles, but within every tile, the file is still in the flight line order. And uh, you, you see the ground points, you see the trees, you see some classified water, and the orange bits are 
uh, points classified as buildings. That's a, that's a scene without so much vegetation. When you have more vegetation, uh, compression becomes more difficult because the points jump up and down in that direction all the time. And uh, this predictive coder sort of looks at subsequent points to do the prediction. And just some numbers for these particular data sets. Here again, I, I square uh, the free compressor against the $3,000 product. Um, we have a compression of 9% with uh, LATS and Mr. Sid, how it's called, only gets 25%. But it really makes a difference when you look at the encoding and decoding times. Um, uh, the, the commercial product is 20 times slower on encoding and three times slower on decoding. That was a data without many trees. And this is how it looks like when you have a lot of vegetation. Then both coders are not quite as good because they both suffer from that. And, uh, but overall, you, know, you see a very similar behavior. And there are some detailed results that should be really at the very end and not at this point. Um, just to summarize about the compressed format, which is actually used in, uh, uh, it's, it's not just an academic um, idea anymore. It's now really used in practice. Um, and it, part of it is the fact that it's open source, LGPL licensed, and uh, free. Um, there's already support for LAZ in a lot of commercial products. Topo.fme 2012, Global Mapper, Reprocess is about to be released, and uh, of course, you know, my, my own software and several others. You can download it on many websites because that's where it really shines, because the compression rate can be, you know, 1 to 10 to 1 to 12, 1 to 7, and that means you have to wait 10 times less long or 7 times less long. Uh, so in open topography, you can you can choose to download the points in LATS format. Um, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources will soon have the entire state of Minnesota online, and they'll only have it online in LAZ format because it just takes so much load of the FTP servers. Um, there you see you know, the LATS files. And uh, NOAA just uh, provided it now as an option to do so and uh, the United States Geological Survey is using it now too and here's some quotes you know that's from Fugro that's a very big uh, um, commercial acquirer of LIDAR data um, and uh, this is the Bloom group in Europe they're very big and they you know they used to um, FedEx last DVDs and now they just FedEx uh, last files I mean that's just a quote one of the engineers gave me and that's the NOAA guy, you know, he moved the entire holdings from Digital Coast from LATS to LATS, and it saved 15 terabytes of this space that also needs to be backed up and so on. All right. Um, so compression, that's one uh, of the cool technologies in LAS tools. And that's completely open source. You can look at the code. Uh, you can integrate it into your own tools. Uh, Spatial indexing is another one, and uh, I think I have a demo here. Oh, I didn't. Oops, I didn't check that. But can you read? Oh yeah, that's nice and large. So um, here is the LAZ file of one flight strip, or I think it's two flight strips, and. I told, I, I told you, you know, this is a lot in the command line. So let's have a look with last zip. And if I do minus size as an option, it doesn't actually decompress it. If I, but it just looks at how big this, the file would be if it was, if I would start the decompressor now. And it would be like 3.7 gigabytes instead of 420 megabytes. So, but what I really wanted to show you here was um, was having a look at this 3.7 gigabyte file with the viewer. And here we go. The viewer downsamples the data and 
displays it as it streams and as it is uncompressed. You've seen that before. So let me stop it here and display a spatial quadri. Now this spatial quadri is used for spatial indexing. Well, what is spatial indexing? Well, often I don't want to have to go through an entire 3.7 gigabyte file just to get to some points in some very small area that I'm interested in. So these LEX files, I'll, I'll get back to that in a second, tell you sort of where the points are in the file. And this is a visualization of it. Here you see how this is done internally through some adaptive quadri structure. And I can now query the quadri. And at this, if I, if I want to, if my query area overlaps this quadri cell, it tells me I will need to load these points. So if I would draw like a rectangle somewhere here, then the union of all the quadri cells and of all the points that they reference is the only section I need to load. And I can then seek to that point in the, in the tree. And the idea here is to do that as lightweight as possible. And with that, this little file here, with last tools, whenever this lux file is existent, it is there with the same name, then automatically you have spatial indexing. If it's not there, you still can use spatial indexing, but it will be very slow because the entire file will have to be looked through. So I give you a little demo here. I started with the GUI, put minus GUI. And, uh, oh, and the other thing, you get sort of a little preview. You don't just get the blocks, you get a, a bit of an idea where those spatial cells are. Now imagine I want the very end of this file, like here. That's at the very end of 3.7 gigabytes uncompressed LAS. And I want to view it. Then it would usually take very long to get to that point. But because there is the LAX file, it instantly seeks to where the points are. Loads, it loads more. It loads, you know, 100 points more. But it loads a lot less than passing through the whole file. And this works hand in hand. It works with the LAS or the LAZ format. There is no difference. Um, and uh, oh, I forgot to do that. Yeah, um, I spent last summer, uh, winter actually, summer for you. Um, I, as I went to uh, the Canary Island. I, I meant to come here, but then things uh, didn't work out the way they should. So I went to the Canary Islands instead. And they have an island called El Hierro. I don't know if you know the Canary Islands. There's Tenerife um, uh, and uh, Las Palmas and uh, Gran Canaria. And a small island is called El Hierro. That's a volcano uh, pretty active underwater right now. Maybe you've heard about that at the news. So and then, uh, I was working with one of the companies. And they were afterwards, they gave me the entire uh, LIDAR um, collect of that island. And it's 20 gigabytes. or two gigabytes in a compressed format. And here you see why I chose the interface um, to be as it is right now. Um, sorry. There we go. Ah, yeah. So here you got the whole, uh, the whole island. Um, and it's covered with many flight strips. So each, each of these strips is one strip. And as you can see, this is running now off the USB stick. So it's very, very quick. Um, you can sort of inspect where is the data of these the 20 gigabytes. And then 
Well, let's have a look at this one. It's at the coast. And um, just to get an idea. So this is a raw, this is basically the raw data of uh, El Hierro on one side. I should maybe switch the coloring to something more interesting. Here you see now the elevation a little bit better, all like this. Oh, here you, you can look at the intensity of the returns and that's almost like a black and white picture. Uh, here you see the rock structure. The flat area here is the ocean. And with the LA, so also we are working off this little tiny USB stick. If I now want to go and see, you know, what's here in the middle. And now I switch to process all files. Hope that works and never tried it. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I instantly get, well, that wasn't a very interesting area. I instantly get I think this is again mostly water oh there you go there you see actually some some mountain roads so this this tool is down sampling because last view is just sort of a tool to let you interact quickly with the data so you can then start the actual processing but um, one of the things you then no, let me go on. Right, so let me s continue with the Canary Island um, project. So I got contacted by the university that they wanted to use last tools to do some work on the pine forests that are north of the Tate volcano, because they have a big fire problem that it tends to burn when it's really hot in the summer. And they wanted to make some uh, uh, simulation to how the fire would propagate, where you have to put in uh, uh, these, um, these fire, um, you know, where you, where you do the cutouts to prevent the fire from spreading. Um, and I said, oh, really? Um, I have some availability right now, uh, so uh, why don't I come out and help you? And um, so I got to escape the German winter, which I'm not very fond of, and go to the island. And this is the product we we created was a height map. Well, that tells you for every point uh, on the island how high is the canopy, or what's the highest, I should tell, what's the highest point above the ground, the highest LIDAR point that was hit that's above the ground, where blue is zero and red is, deep red is 40 meters. So uh, this is the, the area we looked at in particular. And here, you, for example, you see um, the blue, the funny blue, uh, blue um, cut that goes straight to the forest that is a, a, an electricity line going across where the crews regularly cut out all the forest to make sure no a tree falls on the, on the, on the power lines. Um, and so the idea was when I got there, we had this result in almost uh, two weeks. And I said, oh, yeah, let's publish it. That looks really cool because it gives you sort of a map of where are the high trees. And German tourists, really, they like to go in the forest and hike around, so there would be a nice tourist map to, you know, you can just look at this map and you know where the high trees are. But then the professor said, we're not gonna publish that map. I said, they're gonna laugh at us because red means 40 meters. And I said, there are no 40 meter trees on Tenerife. And I said, okay, um, what are you doing now? So we said, let's, let's go and investigate. And at the time, you know, I did some Google searches, and I just, I just found out that El Centurion was found by accident with a Google, uh, with a with a lidar, uh, um, with a lidar survey in Australia, to be the largest uh, living softwood 
It's, a, it's just above 100 meters, I think. And they called it El Centurion, and I was already thinking, oh, maybe we can have a cooler result that the biggest eucalyptus is actually not in Australia, it's on Teneriffa. That would really make the news. But instead, we decided to investigate what was the deal here. So we got into a car, got the survey equipment, and we're looking for these big trees. But Teneriffa is full of uh, um, uh, gorges, so you get lost very easily. So you walk up the wrong one, and you can't get anywhere else. So there we got stuck. You get very tired, but in, uh, in that part of the, uh, of the world, you always take a siesta when you get tired. So we did that. And then we went on, and then eventually we thought we found it. We double-checked, and here's uh, Alejandro, with whom I was working, and he makes sure we are really at the right spot. And there we were. There were really no 40-meter trees. But what was here? There was a really, really steep mountain with really tall trees on them. The trees were maybe 20, 25 meters, but they were situated at a place where you just had to walk one meter and you went down 20 meters. So the problem is that the tree height and the canopy height are not immediately related in terrains with a big slope. Because this is a laser beam coming down, and this is the same tree again and again, and I'm measuring now where do I hit that branch. Well, I'm again the same tree but the distances become bigger and bigger and now I double the size of the tree so, and imagine you have a tree standing by you know the size of a, of a cliff that can go down a thousand meters and you would measure a, a tree with a height of a, over a thousand meters so that's why I, in a lot of publications I always see canopy height equals tree height more or less and that's really true uh, if you have um, flat terrains but if you add a uh, steepness, it very quickly becomes rather wrong. The other thing we found, there were, there were uh, errors in the map. Um, like here you see there was lacking data. There you see a little triangle. And here you see this cut out. And initially it was blamed on me. Oh, your software, you know, missed some data here. Um, uh, so I created a point density map. Hey, you, you, for every five by five meter area, you just count how many points fall in there, and then you calculate how many points per square meter do you have. And this is colored here from zero points per square meter to four points per square meter. And uh, suddenly, you actually see the flight lines. You see the overlap, because the overlap areas of the flight lines, you get higher point density. And very quickly, I could point out that this funny area which is not my problem at all, but a very poorly planned uh, flight uh, sequence where you see how the flight strips end and leaves this you know funny shape, just like here. Uh, I don't know. They had just you know, had they just gone like uh, twenty meters more, uh, they would have had a nice coverage, but they were very sparse in their flight planning. All right. Um, so after all these results, I contacted the people that did this survey and then who had already been using my software or knew my software. And I said, how about, you know, I'll help you and we find out a nice way of processing the data. Because in the Canary Islands, they really only did the LiDAR flights. Oh, another use for LiDAR. Not to make maps or anything. They did the LiDAR flights for only one reason. Every year they fly. And then they compare the flight of that year with that of the previous year, and they look for changes in elevation, and then they cross-correlate that to building permits but in the government database. And if they find, like, there's a new story on a building somewhere, they send the people out to either, you know, give them a big fine or make sure they pay their taxes or I don't know what. Because there's a very big problem in the, in the Canary Islands with illegal constructions. People just you know, build stuff. And uh, unfortunately, they started just uh, two years ago and not 20 years ago, because Teneriffa is very built up already. It's, uh, it's not so nice anymore, like it must have been 20 years ago. Um, 
So here's just some, some little details. I don't really want to bore you. Uh, these are some of the tools you find when you download last tools. You find last info, which just gives you what's in that file in a textual way. Last view, you've seen it. It just it's a, it's a, it's a hack. It's like a I did it in my fourth years of college, uh, a little OpenGL view, and it's basically still the same code. Um, it's terrible, uh, and I should make it a little better, and I will in the future. Um, last boundary computes a boundary around your points, so you know where your points are, and you can also find voids in your data, just like the voids you've seen before, uh, where there's a problem. Last grid creates these, for example, these pointer grids, where you create the density, and you can see the flight lines, and you can compute many different statistics. I mean, here, the options do density. Um, you can find duplicate points. Sometimes you get, you get a LIDAR file, and the same LIDAR file is it's twice, just concatenated. But you, if you look at it, you don't see it, because every point is just on top of every other point. But if you run last duplicate, it'll tell you, you know, there are like five million duplicate points in there, and then you know that only half the points are actually unique. And uh, last overlap that checks for vertical alignment. You can see if your data is actually nice. So wh what kind of work are people doing? So of course, inspecting the data. We've done that a few times. Uh, that's the first task you get when you just have this point cloud. But um, then there's a lot of preparation going on. You, before you can deliver a product that's derived from the LiDAR data, you need to prepare the LiDAR data in a way that you can extract meaningful information from it. And you may have to go to a different geoid uh, because the data is often provided in such a way that if you do a calculation that has to do with how the river flows and you on the ellipsoid, then the, the results are completely wrong because the ellipsoid has nothing to do with the way that gravity works. Um, you may have to tile your data because it's too big. You may want to find the ground points. Well, not you may. You always pretty much want to find the ground points where you actually hit the ground. Then you can measure how high points are above the ground. You can make canopy maps. And you can maybe find where are the buildings. If you want to calculate what's the total amount of uh, covered area, you know, or what's the total amount of area where I could install solar panels then you want to know where the roofs are, and then you want to compute the inclination of the roofs, and so on. So extracting the bare earth, um, you do that with last ground. Um, I can maybe just do it, last ground. Oh. That's a small section of El Hierro. And then minus O dix, that means I'm adding an appendix to the file that's called G. So the next file will be EHG. So and ah, we already are outputting. So last view. E H G dot LAS. I didn't use. There we go. That's the area that was the original point. And the ones I classified just now are now brown. So if I look at the brown points and I triangulate them, I get, you know, I get the bare earth of somewhere in El Hierro. And before, the point that I got off the scanner, if I look at all of them, and I triangulate those, it looks like that. So the trees basically were removed. Um, uh, of course, you can always do the same thing. If you don't want to work in the command line, you know, you just, uh, the tool tells you what it does, extracts the bare earth by classifying all ground points. You can run a readme. You know, there's a readme file that tells you everything the tool is doing, how it's working, what all the parameters are. And you have the option of choosing the things here. Um, 
run and then you get the command line that I typed in you get it here and you can even edit it like the odix parameter isn't in the command line yet uh, isn't in the in the GUI and then you could start it but I'm gonna cancel now and go back to the presentation so we just extracted the ground points and then it looks like this now you can classify the trees I'm not going to show that now because uh, um, I just give you the commands to do that and then if you want to do canopy height calculation or you want to know how high are the trees you can normalize it by replacing the Z coordinate of every point with the height of all the points above the triangulation of only the points that you set were ground so for every point you basically drop down until you hit a triangle that's part of a triangulation of the ground points and then you calculate that distance and you make that the new Z coordinate and then you get sort of a normalized forest, the mountains are gone you like flattened the forest and you see um, the trees but keep in mind it's not exactly correct because of the slope issue I mentioned before so this is how high the leaves are above the ground but the trees are sort of a little distorted based on the slope they're on basically the the area of the tree that's that's downhill will appear higher and the area of the tree the side of the tree that's towards the uphill will be appear lower I don't know I haven't seen a paper how to correct that maybe that's an interesting uh, little thing to study uh, so then people can uh, count how many points fall in there normalize it somehow and then you have a biomass um, or a fire mass uh, model uh, because it sort of tells you how dense is the forest at any given point and I think in, in the fire modeling they they look how easy can the fire cross uh, cross like if, if, if all the crowns are very high and there's very little here then the fire is very forest resistant because but if there's a lot of thing where the fire sort of can work its way up then it's more dangerous but I don't know much more about that and then you can create derivatives so now we prepared the LIDAR in a way that we know these are ground points these are building points these are you know the heights of the points above the ground now we can cr create derivatives for example maps maps that are then used by people because people are used to looking at maps and they need to be shaded in a way that's intuitive to to us um, and uh, there are a variety of tools where you take in the LIDAR points and you create something else you don't create new LIDAR points like before but now you create image you create contour lines or you create counter grids that you then feed into a fire simulation and uh, here's one such example from uh, um, El Hierro we this is triangulating all the points and here's only the ground points and I'm always every time I look at this again I'm like wow it's like you can see you can see through the forest suddenly a forest is just gone and that's something unique to LIDAR it's very hard to do that with any other technique because getting down to the ground you know a laser yeah goes all the way down um, you sort of when you do a photo technique whenever it's covered by too many leaves it's it's very hard to uh, to know what's below there and um, here's a canopy map for the same area so you see that in the very center there's very dense forest see in the very center that's very dense forest now I don't just say that um, I say that with a reason because um, so I loaded everything into ArcGIS here's ArcGIS Tenerife or the Grand Canaria or the Canary Islands have a wonderful web service you can you can connect to all these really cool WMS services and get topo maps and hillshade maps and vegetation maps and and uh, urban uh, boundary use whatever kind of maps 
so uh, here are the two maps we created, just a small section of it, overlaid on the topo map. Now this is right now the official map. The official map, it's a five meter. That means for every five meter there's a pixel, for every five meter by five meter. And this is the map we created that's 2.5 by 2.5 meters. So it's a bit unfair because we have more detail, but there are significant differences beyond the more detail. I mean, you see, they use a lot of terrace, um, or they used to, terraced uh, agriculture. You see these beautiful terraces here. And uh, in the very middle, I pointed it out, I want to draw your attention to this very spot. That's where all the vegetation was. The official map is missing a mountain. And that's because this is a topo map. There is, I mean, I clearly there's a, there's a mountain top here, and it goes down on both sides, and there's a yeah, little creek. But uh, the official map doesn't have any of that, and the topo map doesn't show any mountain there. And the reason is there was incredibly dense forest. There was no way to see for the photogrammetry guy, because the original um, maps are photogrammetry derived. He can't see. When he can't see, it's an art. He has to interpolate. Making maps is kind of an art, and he did a good job, but it wasn't quite reality. And that's, there you see how dense a forest is at this point. And we found, we found a whole bunch of places where it was like that. Um, well, that's just uh, well, the high-resolution map. OK. and. Uh, the really cool thing about being able to work on the command line, and I said that's how really I want people to use uh, last tools, is that you can write scripts that process many, many files. And these scripts, you just sort of test them on a small data set. And once they work, you just run them, and you go home, or you go party, or you go on a vacation. And when you come back, short vacation, because these tools are efficient. No, don't go on a long vacation. <laughs> and, uh, then it's all done, and here, these are the workflows actually used now at Grafcan, this company in, uh, in, uh, in the Tenerife. And so when we were done, he sh sent me some uh, things to share. This is something he created now. He added, he did a little bit Photoshop magic too. So you see uh, he, used, he used the uh, height we created to make a shading of the nature. So it's slightly, the shading slightly varies depending on the height of the tree. You don't really see that with your eyes, it's that obvious, but it makes it very, look very nice. Here, you, the craters you know, are really beautiful. And if you look at the original maps, El Hierro is a volcanic island. I mean, some of the craters you don't even recognize as craters, like this one up there, which is so beautiful. It's, it's, it all just looks sort of like a bump. And then he put it all together. Uh, he, you know, clipped out the water, made the water. You know, they have uh, shape files that describe the water line. He uh, he knows where the buildings are. Well, at least the buildings that are legal. And he cut them out and he made them pink. And this is sort of a final composite that will be soon also on the server. And this is now a product he created from data that was originally just flown to find people that built illegal buildings. So since Spain is a bit in a in a crisis, they tried to very hard to get an extra value out of the things they got anyways. And that was a very nice way of doing so. Oh, another thing you see here is hydro flattening. You know, this, there's actually a, very, a lot of noise here, but he knows that there's a lake or a pond or a reservoir, so he used a technique. There's one more thing I just want to mention, and then I'm done. That's full waveform. I only talked about discrete points. But when you shoot down this laser pulse, uh, the next generation of LiDAR, especially for forestry applications, will then sample the pulse you shoot down. So you know, because they're not always the same pulse, they vary a lot. Every laser shot is slightly different. But more importantly, when it then goes down and hits stuff, like a bird or you know, some branches or eventually the ground, it will not just return a point, for the places where it hit something, but it will record the full wave. What came back? How strong was the reflection from the ground? 
And then you get basically the whole wave, and you can decide to figure out on your own what is a meaningful thing, how much biomass there is, and many, many applications that people haven't even thought about it because we don't really have access to such data a whole lot. And uh, one reason is there is no format like the LES format yet. And uh, I'm involved in an effort to create such a format right now, and that's a format that's going to be called Pulse Waves. And you can learn more about it there. And that's it. Thank you very much for staying all the way to the end. As I will do, um, before I open for questions, I saw one very nice thing. Uh, the first visualization how laser is, laser, LIDAR is uh, collected by aeroplane, you had a twin engine, rather large aircraft. The previous slide of this one here, you have already shrunk to a rather small aeroplane, so I expect next time when you really pull space has going, that that will be one of our funny aeroplanes on your <laughs> Anyway, but uh, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, the, uh, the imagery from the Mary Island is very, you know, it's a photographic picture, so it's not just going to It's really very, very impressive. Um, I kind of wondered, um, a long time ago, people were using you know, a picture or a you know, land navigation when they were doing a picture. So, there's going to be any application Actually, um, yes, they, uh, I think I'm on Twitter a lot, and somebody just tweeted. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people retweet it, uh, so that always means it's important. Uh, um, that uh, they used LIDAR to find uh, another uh, tectonic uh, plate that wasn't known before somewhere near Lake Tahoe. Uh, in uh, western, uh, uh, in northern California. So, uh, yeah, um, these uh, accidental findings of LIDAR, like ancient burial sites, um, old uh, wagon routes, uh, because you can suddenly look through the forest in a, in, a, in a global way without all the trees. You see a line that you couldn't possibly see when you just see a small patch on the ground. So a lot of discoveries um, uh, are made this way. I mean, that same context, a, a very dramatic application is really erosion. Because erosion happens under vegetation, and it's very difficult to see. So one of the challenges at the moment when we are involved in this is to refly areas continuously and then find how the uh, erosion happens underneath vegetation proceeds, or if there is any, or what happens. But that requires very high accuracy. But the, the, the point is that without having tools like this, which actually you can use quickly without a, a learning curve that is takes three years to learn on each complicated package, you, you have no chance to these sort of answers. You need something that is, you, 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 get, you, you can do something in a short time. And, and that's really where your work comes in really valuable. Any other questions? Another comment from the other one. Those lines were in the photometric data and so on. Uh, uh, you were saying that basically you were looking for a problem for your solution, but it is not uh, one step further that now your solution can be applied to a lot of other problems with the last format and what can be done with the last data has become so useful that now people are recoding other data into the last format. So I saw it's basically have something which has X, Y, Z and the attributes with that point, whether it's radar data or uh, radiometric data and so on, uh, it's convenient to now put it into the last form and apply two last tools to it uh, to, to mangle the data. So it's basically run full circle and become a general point cloud tool again. Can you just put on the ground or monitor the hyperspectral data into the last form? And that opens up quite interesting avenues for doing it. If you go away from the pixel, stick with the original data. And also more about like looking for solutions. Like maybe just I can say two sentences. I mean, while we were here, there was another one with the uh, multi-beam depth sounder, which suddenly seems to be another application of where you can do something useful with it. 
So I just, just type out now. How do you think about it? Well, you talked about um, the application of uh, clearance of trees for vegetation on the power line. Do your tools, like that, have you looked at automated methods of identifying and classifying the power line, like where you've got a coherent structure that's sort of traced out in the I repeatedly get requests to add this functionality and it's on my to-do list and I have plenty of scribbled papers with various ideas how to do this because I want to do it really fast. Um, I, I, I can think of ways of doing that but they wouldn't be so fast so I would like to find them very fast. Um, that tool probably will be part of Last Classify eventually. Um, yeah, I am definitely thinking about it because it's, uh, it's one of the applications that pays the bill. Um, uh, it's not you know, not necessarily the most exciting one, but the power companies, for them, maintaining the power lines and making sure they are free of trees is a very important thing. And having an automated method of doing so means a saving that it can be substantial. And so if I can uh, get uh, power companies to buy last tools, uh, then uh, my, uh, I, I suddenly have a financial resources I may otherwise not be able to get. So that's definitely on my list of things to do. Um, I was thinking too of, of once that capability exists, then it will be a bit more complicated Yeah, so there's actually an entire conference dedicated to that, and I'm, I was just reading sort of proceedings um, because I'm going to this conference this year and I don't want to appear like a complete fool. Uh, so I'm not really knowledgeable to the techniques, but just uh, glossing over the papers and looking at the various things, I know that there are techniques, academic techniques out there that do exactly that. Um, often they take a uh, terrestrial LIDAR into account because the point entity is so much higher that it becomes really easy to identify these. I'm not sure that you get enough points at the base of the tree to robustly do that if the canopy filters away most of your laser beam. It might be better if you have more control about which returns are significant if you have full waveform data because then you can also use the less strong um, returns at, at the very bottom that may correspond to hits of the trunk of the tree but because so much intensity was lost on its way through the canopy uh, the commercial software won't output them they say oh that's just noise another comment about the, uh, the uh, wires um, we actually deliberately yesterday I got to fly uh, with Jörg we deliberately flew along one of the power lines to uh, get me a nice set of test data uh, once I find the time to uh, try to do a wire detection algorithm. Well, I think Jörg has sort of his own software suit that was uh, developed in-house that does that turns the scanner optics and the flight trajectory and the GPS uh, times and locations and does a lot of mass. Um, that's a RASP, and then outputs basically georeference points in last format, and at that point is really when last tools kicks in and. Um, but uh, so there's there's two steps, but uh, but it's it's really two two different of possibly parallel avenues after that because uh, it was very interesting with Mark having Mark in here and, and really talking to the man directly to see how we do things our way 
and I'm working with my developer here in the garage, my first developer, and see how it's done in my instruments. It's interesting crossing over and there's sometimes we have the bigger ideas, sometimes Marty has the bigger ideas. It's quite interesting, but uh, it's very compatible because there are standardized formats. Things go for streamlined. Oh, yeah. I mean, in the same context, this is why we are trying to do a marking here. Why for a while, okay, for all the while of it. So. People do exactly that. Like they take the output of the last tools and then have yet another set of tools to model hydrological flow or. Um, there's, it's a very, I mean, especially now with, uh, with floodings occurring all over the world, and not to mention here in Australia. It's been a very active research uh, area of research to develop very good uh, flow modeling tools. Uh, I know in uh, in uh, in Denmark and Holland, you know, places which uh, where you just need to raise the water level a little bit, they are very concerned about accuracy in this in this respect, where you know the the exact the exact um, direction that water will flow matters. Yeah, to take it offline. There's still a problem in that data usually bridges, like that might be a bridge crossing that stream, are actually considered to be part of the ground because they are literally part of the ground. Um, you know, there's a, it's a white bridge with a little hole uh, under the bridge. I mean, there's no way I can detect that this is a man-made object because um, so hydro enforcement to remove move bridges and uh, is, is is another post processing that needs to happen and often happens manually yeah especially here when the water goes under uh, uh, then you you know if there's a rock that goes all the way to the ground well then it's correct because it has to overflow the rock but here the water can can go through without having to cross the bridge, you know, it goes under the bridge. Okay. Yeah. 